welcome to Justin and Caroline Welby, the 105th Archbishop of Canterbury. I don't think I need to say anything more about you two because I think you are global superstars. And uh, so, so I, I can't, accept, but, but I did, what I realized uh, today is I think I have known both of you, each of you, for longer than you've known each other. Yes. So I knew Justin before he met Caroline, and I also knew I knew Caroline, and I, actually I knew Caroline before you met Justin, and actually Caroline, I knew your parents um, even before I met you, because uh, your and tell us tell us a bit about your family because your dad Douglas Eaton was on the Kensington Chelsea Council with my mother, and one of my earliest memories is them coming to dinner in our home. No, so no, that, I don't think I knew that. But we met uh, Nikki. I think um, we were in a Bible study group together yes. when I was just exploring. Um, yep. I didn't know which way was up, and you were there uh, on the day that I became a Christian. So yes, yeah. I remember it so well. So, Carol, how did that happen? I mean, how did you get to that? That it was in Sandy Miller's house, wasn't it, in Onslow Square? But what brought you there? Um, my sister and uh, my sister was a student in Durham and um, she had met Sandy and uh, she was a Christian and I was about to go to university and I was just on the edge of um, wanting to know more. I didn't think I could do that. I thought it was all about being good and trying hard. And I knew that that wasn't going to be possible. And so she brought me to a new Bible study group that Sandy had started. And he just said, it's not about, um, this is the beginning of a relationship and it doesn't matter if you fail, you know, and it just, it just changed the whole way in which I understood what uh, being a Christian was. That was the beginning. So this would be 1976? Yes. Yes. Uh, and just what happened to you that day? What what was the experience that you had? Well, I just remember him him saying, um, we had our eyes shut and he said, I want you to bring to mind, you know, let things come to your mind that you need to say sorry for. As that happened, he said, you know, um, you know, this is a commitment God makes to you. And, um, you know, um, um, and he promises never to leave you. And it was just the most amazing relief to realise it wasn't up to me. So, so, that, so did you actually meet in London or did you meet in Cambridge? We met in Cambridge. We, he and his friends uh, used to invite a whole load of people to supper before an evangelistic... Um, uh, story, um, evangelistic talk. So that was that. your first date? That was your first date to go to an evangelistic talk? It did. <laughs> you know, it's how to give a girl a good time. So. <laughs> and, <laughs> never ever took me a, to a ball, I have to say. Never <laughs> took me to a ball. <laughs> your mum is the most amazing person. I mean, Jane, Lady, what, Lady Williams, Jane Williams, uh, was Jane Paul? I mean, she is the. Uh, she comes, of course, to to one of the um, HDB sites, and uh, she's the most wonderful, wonderful person. She was in the car, wasn't she, with Winston Churchill? Uh, to correct me if this story is wrong, what I've heard is that when uh, when the King died, yes. and so Queen Elizabeth II were, uh, became the Queen of England and had to come back from her foreign travels. Winston, she went with Winston Churchill to the airport and Winston Churchill was apparently, I, what I've been told, Winston Churchill was, was weeping and so was your mother um, as they went to the airport. Um, well, he, to he, they drove out to the airport and in those days the Prime Minister had one detective, so they had the detective in the car and there was uh, the driver and my mother and, and um, Churchill and he was dictating as they drove the speech that he would give uh, to the House of Commons on the death of the King and on um, uh, the accession of, of the Queen. And it was a great speech. And 
and um, she he was in tears, she was in tears, the driver was in tears, the detective was in tears. I mean, <laughs> it was it was quite something. And and there's that famous photograph of the Queen. Yes, I've seen it on yeah. the steps. Yeah, of the aircraft. She flown back from Kenya, and just at the top of the steps and at the bottom of the steps, these line the cabinet, a line of old men, and this remarkable young woman, extraordinary. And he uh, and my mother was standing just next to the photographer when he took that picture. Um, so yes, one of many extraordinary memories. And there are other things that I, you know, that comes up and says, oh, I remember that. And, Amazing. And, and I say, tell me about it. She says, no, I can't. I signed the official secret act. You know? <laughs> <laughs> She's very discreet. <laughs> you two met up in in Cambridge. You got married, and and when you you did some quite exciting things, and you went off and kind of smuggled Bibles behind the Iron Curtain and all kinds of things. Caroline, tell us about those times. Um, so this little organisation was based in Holland, and we knew some people. Justin had already spent a summer there. He had already committed to go to somewhere in Eastern Europe. Uh, which, of course, in those days, um, uh, the Iron Curtain and Bibles uh, in very short supply, if at all, and a lot of persecution of Christians. You had to learn where you were going. You couldn't take any addresses with you. And um, we took little camper vans with secret compartments. I mean, it sounds terribly cloak and dagger it was it was quite quite you were sort of on on the edge and praying hard as you went it was dangerous it. it was a dangerous thing to do in those days you could get arrested yes but it was much more dangerous for the people in those countries who were putting their lives literally at risk and their families lives at risk by being willing to receive things we would have had an uncomfortable few hours and then we would have just been expelled um but it was a very it was it was a very um um growing couple of seasons that we did that and, Presumably, um, they were very grateful to get the Bibles. They were. They were. We we took the second time. We took Christian literature because that was in, in even less supply, wasn't it? It was. And um, I mean, it's hard to recollect for us now. These were not slightly authoritarian regimes. This was totalitarian communism. Mm -hmm. And they had at many times stopped churches meeting. Uh, they prohibited the printing or distribution of Bibles. They arrested church pastors. They forbade anything to do with work with youth or children. Um, it was a, they were cruel, very dark and wicked regimes. I was reading um, your the first major biography of Archbishop Justin Welby by Andrew. And he, and he says that when you were in one of your parishes, you were known as Mr. Alpha. I would love to see, I would love to see that almost, except in the most unusual circumstances, every church gathering, whether whatever it is, has something like Alpha. And um, Alpha's the one I know best. Um, so that people who are inquiring about what it means to be a Christian, where God has begun to warm their hearts, can find a way, a safe place to ask, ask every question they want without ever being judged, and to hear the Christian faith laid out before them in a way that is really clear, very straightforward and accessible and relevant to them. And I think from my point of view, the, the genius of Alpha is that it's been done in the smartest churches in England, 
it's been done in the poorest churches in England. I even taught Maasai leaders how to do Alpha hmm. at one point in Tanzania. Wow. But it leads you to expect to develop a relationship with God in Jesus Christ. And that is something God does perfectly for every human being. It, it, God is the ultimate bespoke maker of lives. They are never mass produced. They're never off the peg. They are perfect for every single human being. And, and somehow, particularly with the Holy Spirit day or weekend or whatever you do, somehow people meet with God in Christ so beautifully and powerfully and transformingly at that time. Uh, and, and so who wouldn't do that? I mean, why not? Mm. And um, fast forward, 2013, you're being what is it what is it enthroned enthroned in canterbury cathedral you were so sweet you, you very i had the huge privilege of staying with you um when that happened and I, I it was an unforgettable moment you know surrounded by all those bishops with prince charles and all the other sort of establishment and and everybody else um there and a wonderful wonderful moment um and i remember you saying that the anointing followed the Pointing, or you didn't maybe use that expression. But that was basically what you were saying, um, something yeah. along those lines. Funnily enough, we never. It was so unlikely that I'd be appointed. I'd been a bishop only. I mean, when I was announced, I'd been a bishop just on twelve months and a week, or something, two weeks, or something like that. And um, uh, I'd been in post uh, as a Darson bishop for 11 months or something like that. And so it was really ridiculous. Why are you still, you know, why are you still, you're not just, I mean, you're not just in these positions, but you are still telling people the good news about Jesus. And, and why should someone who's listening to this right now put their faith in Jesus? I would say, well, that 45 years ago in a few months, I put my life in the hands of Jesus Christ and asked him to be Lord of my life. Something happened. I wasn't even sure I believed in God, but he came into my life and through all that's happened since, he has always been there, calling me back when I run away, strengthening me when I'm weak, teaching me, rebuking me, searching me, leading me. And in this extraordinary adventure, as Caroline said, of the last eight years, this extraordinary adventure. And despite all the fol de -rol and the ups and downs and the horrendous attacks in the press sometimes and yeah. other people saying, oh, how important you are, all that stuff. That's nothing to do with it. At its heart is what I know each morning as I pray in the early morning, as I tell him I love him and I find afresh his love for me, his forgiveness, his grace, his assurance that whether I'm successful or a failure, he does not change at all. And for the evidence, there is the historic reality of the fact that someone called Jesus lived, that he was crucified, during the governorship of Pontius Pilate and the indisputable fact that he rose physically from the dead and that his frightened and terrified followers within a month or so were out on the streets telling people about the God who visited them and changed them. So there's that historical side, there's the growth of the church, 
But most of all, there's the fact that I meet him every day. Wonderful. Thank you both so much. Honestly, such a privilege um, to have you both and, and such profound wisdom and um, amazing, amazing that God has raised you up for such a time as this. Thank you, Nikki.